These two cars are separated by almost exactly 55 years, yet the new car is spiritually aligned with the old one in a way that hasn't happened at Alfa Romeo in decades. This car, the original Alfa Romeo Giulia GTA, is almost indistinguishable from the Giulia GT from which it was derived, but it cost 50% more when it was new. Today that value gap has grown to approximately 800%. So what do you get for all that extra dough? Quite a bit less, as it turns out. You see, the A in GTA stands for Alegerita, or Lightened, and they weren't kidding around when they applied that letter. It weighs 500 pounds less than the regular Giulia GT, itself hardly a porker at about 2300 pounds. Yet the GTA weighs 1800. So how did they do this? Easy. They changed, well, everything. Oh yes, and sourced an exotic alloy and made most of the car out of that, and redesigned the window winder mechanisms to make them lighter. Yes, really. And why? Because race car. The GTA remains, even today, one of the most successful touring cars to ever race. During the years that separate these two cars, Alfa Romeo dusted off the GTA moniker a handful of times for production cars. Sadly, always front wheel drive, and not a Leggerita at all. In fact, both the 147 and 156 GTAs were heavier than the cars on which they were based. Not so with the new Giulia GTA, which weighs as much as 220 pounds less than the Giulia Quadrifoglio. It's easy for us to forget this nowadays, but before there was Ferrari, there was Alfa Romeo. Enzo Ferrari started his little car company after World War II, but 25 years earlier, he was a team driver at Alfa Romeo, and he went on to set up his own racing team, Fielding Alphas, a few years later. Ferrari's team eventually became the de facto Alfa Romeo race team when the company withdrew the factory team for financial reasons in 1933. Alpha won their first world championship in 1925, they won Le Mans with the 8C four years in a row in the first half of the 1930s, and won the Mille Miglia 10 out of the 11 years between 1928 and 1938. They also won two F1 championships in the early 1950s before withdrawing from racing again. So these GTAs come from good stock. Before the war and into the early post-war period, Alfa made relatively small numbers of premium cars with large, by European standards, engines. Even in the 1920s, they were twin cam units, supercharged in the spicy variants, which dominated on the racetracks and were among the most desirable road cars in the world. Ferrari of its time, as we've said. After the war, however, demand for this type of car was low, especially in Europe where reconstruction and gasoline shortages were the order of the day, rather than exotic high-performance cars. BMW found themselves in a similar predicament, making big, expensive cars in small numbers, a problem which they solved by buying the license to manufacture an Italian microcar, the Azetta. Alfa Solution was different. They designed a car that brought all of the traditional Alfa Romeo virtues to the market in a smaller and much more affordable package, creating a car that saved the company and became a legend, the Giulietta. Even the story behind the name is the stuff of legend. Apparently a Russian prince visiting the factory noted the presence of many Romeos working and remarked that there weren't enough Juliets, and so the new small car was called Giulietta to provide some gender balance at the Alfa Romeo factory. But back to the car. The centerpiece of the Giulietta was an all-new 1300cc twin cam inline four designed by Giuseppe Busso absolutely bleeding edge for the time. In addition to being a twin cam, it featured all alloy construction, hemispherical combustion chambers, and a forged crankshaft. Its production lasted from 1954 to 1994, a testament to the sophistication and inherent goodness of the design. It's hard to overstate the impact of the Giulietta. It was a shocking breath of fresh air. While British sports cars looked like overgrown bicycles and drove like tractors, and Porsches were barely beyond the VW Beetle stage, 
the Alfa Romeo was new and exotic, both aesthetically and technically. Tudor variants got gorgeous Bertone or Pininfarina styling, and the cars were just the right size and price for the glamour-hungry but still war-ravaged European market, while also being ideally suited to the emerging American craze for European sports cars. And all this presented with the charming Dolce Vita romance that Americans so love. A displacement increase to 1600cc resulted in a name change to Giulia for 1962, by which time the car's replacement was being readied, the Giulia GT. As with its predecessor, the closed version was styled by Bertone, specifically Giorgetto Giugiaro. It looked modern, but not fussy, while under the skin it was also exciting, with the now familiar twin cam engine, plus 5 speed transmission and disc brakes all round. A set of features which neither Porsche nor Ferrari could match when the Giulia GT appeared in 1963. Although Alfa Romeo had stopped its factory race efforts after its two F1 championship wins in the early 50s, private teams actively and successfully raced their cars for the rest of the 50s and into the 60s. They racked up countless wins in the 1.3 liter class, particularly with the Zagato bodied variant of the Giulietta, the SZ. By the early 60s, Alfa was looking to get back into factory-supported racing and turned to Carlo Chitti, who had worked for Alfa before they stopped racing in the early 50s and spent most of the intervening years at Ferrari. Auto Delta was founded in 1961, and by 1963 it was officially part of Alfa Romeo. Under Chitti's leadership, Auto Delta was tasked with returning Alfa to the forefront of global motor racing, which they attempted with three cars initially the purpose-built TZ to run in the GT class, then the production-derived GTA to run in saloon car racing, and later on the Type 33, which ran as a sports prototype. The 33 met with limited success later in its life, but the TZ and GTA proved to be absolutely dominant. The TZ had high-profile international sports car races like Le Mans, Sebring, Targa Florio, and the Tour de France, and the GTA in touring car races. One of the most important things about running the GTA in the touring car class was that it had to race against the outstanding Lotus Cortina, a dramatically re-engineered Ford Cortina driven by some of the very best drivers in the business. And so Alto Delta didn't mess around when it came to the development of the GTA. They started with the A for Allegerita or Lightened, removing soundproofing and fitting plastic windows, but the biggest weight savings came from remanufacturing most of the car's body out of Peralumen 25 an exotic alloy of aluminum, magnesium, copper, zinc, and manganese. Almost every part of the car's body was made out of this stuff, save for the inner structure and the floor pans, although they tried to make the floor pans out of Peralium in 25, but it proved too fragile to endure the forces of the driver's seat and the occasional contact with the ground during races. Additional weight was saved throughout the rest of the car. The valve cover, timing cover, bell housing, and high-capacity oil sump were all made of magnesium. The car also gained hollow half shafts, aluminum suspension components, and drilled gears and hollow shafts inside the gearbox. The engine was upgraded with the full host of good old-fashioned hot rotting tricks. Twin plug ignition, revised cam profiles, headwork, twin 45mm Weber carburetors, higher compression pistons, strengthened connecting rods, and carefully balanced internals, which raised power from 105 to 150 horsepower in race trim without any increase in displacement. Although it is visually quite similar to the standard car, the long list of changes reflects the fanatical attention with which the GTA was developed. The changes were extremely purposeful and paid dividends on track. The car's first racing outings were in 1965, where periodic driver errors and mechanical troubles kept it from dominating. 1966, however, was a breakout year, with the season beginning with wins at Monza in Italy and Sebring in Florida, where a surprise upset victory by Jochen Rindt in the four-hour Trans Am race against large displacement American cars, including a Mustang driven by AJ Foyt, set the tone for a series of giant killing performances. This was all the more remarkable because Rindt won in a GTA that his co-driver had rolled during practice. In America, the GTA went on to win the 1966 and 1970 Trans Am under 2 liter class championship, while in Europe, the car won the Touring Car Manufacturers Championship five times, often keeping up with cars with much larger displacements such as the BMW 3.0 CSL. 
It's impossible to chronicle all the wins the GTA accumulated both on circuits and in rallies around the world, but the car was an absolute force. A demonstration of how obsessive development of every system in the car yielded one of the most successful touring car racers of all time. In order to homologate the Carter race, 500 examples of the GTA had to be constructed, many of which were originally street trimmed cars sold to the public. Their exotic spec made them expensive, especially for a four cylinder car displacing under two liters. But what buyers got in exchange was an exceptionally focused and pure car, a genuine race car for the road. Today, these cars remain as engaging as they ever were and many are still actively used, including this car which is owned by Alfa Romeo. They brought this car out to celebrate the launch of the new Giulia GTA, which owes much more than just its name to the original. The new GTA is available in two variants, the GTA and the GTA M, which are 110 and 220 pounds lighter than the standard quadrifolio despite the widened front and rear tracks, thanks to more extensive use of carbon fiber and even a thinner front windscreen. The GTA M adds a large rear wing, rear seat delete, polycarbonate rear windows, lighter seats, and both cars benefit from an additional 35 horsepower and revised aerodynamics developed in conjunction with the legendary team Sauber, which now runs Alfa Romeo's Formula One effort. The Giulia Quadrifoglio has rightfully created a sensation. Not only is it the first rear-wheel drive Alfa Romeo sedan in 30 years, it is objectively one of the best driving cars currently on sale. When rumors spread that Alfa Romeo was developing a new rear-wheel drive sedan, enthusiasts were both excited and concerned. Alfa has such a storied history of spectacular driver's cars, but also virtually everything they've made in the last 30 years has been a charming but flawed car that simply cannot compete on the global stage. Critically, the Giulia received a bespoke platform and powertrain and was developed by a small team led by Philippe Crif, whose prior project was the Ferrari 458 Speciale. The lightened, more focused, and more powerful GTA variant, then, is one of the most exciting Alfa Romeos in decades, and like the original 1600 GTA, production is just 500 units. Perhaps one of the most exciting things about the GTA is that it is different from any other Alfa Romeo in recent memory. Philosophically, it represents a return to one of the brightest moments of Alfa's history, and it is the car that we as enthusiasts knew the company had in it but never made, until now. It's a moment we should savor. The company's future has been uncertain many times over the years, and as the end of the enthusiast gasoline car comes into sight, it's probably a good idea to get one now if you can, just to be safe.